Hi, my name is Scott and welcome. This presentation is on human anatomy and physiology as it is related specifically to the science of nutrition. I'm going to cover four topics. I'm going to go over the general structure of a cell and some of its processes. I'll cover nine of 12 of our body systems. Uh, eight I'll go over briefly and then cover in depth is the digestive system. And then I'll wrap it up with the challenges of the GI tract. So let me begin with what makes us an organism? And this is the atomic levels that, that makes an organism. And first it is the chemical level. That's where atoms make molecules. And the cellular level is where molecules form cells. The tissue level is where cells form tissues. And the organ level is where tissues form organs. Organ systems level is where the organ forms organ systems. And the organ system level is where organ systems form the organism. So the cell, let's go into the cell. All cellular processes require a constant turnover of cells and their substances within. They require energy in the form of adenosine triphosphate, and they require nutrients. So it's, it's, a non, it's an ongoing process. Um, and it, I wanted to take this opportunity, since I'm mentioning that it takes energy, to show you a molecule of ATP. It's adenosine triphosphate. Uh, what we have here is a nucleotide base. This is adenine. And we have a ribose, that's a sugar, and we have three phosphates connected to it. Now, with adenine connected to ribose, that makes adenosine. And with the three phosphates, that makes adenosine triphosphate. So where we get energy is if we break this bond on each one of these phosphates, the bond going in there, that liberates free energy. So the cell, uh, I'm going to cover the membrane, the cytoplasm, the mitochondria, the nucleus, the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi complex, lysosomes, and peroxisomes. And here you see the process of the cell basically, it, it starts in the nucleus. That is the center. That's where the DNA is held. And the, what happens is we make proteins from that DNA for our body structures. And so it starts in the DA and it works out of the endoplasmic reticulum into the Golgi complex and then it will leave the cell through excitosis. And you have other organelles within there that, that help the cell function. So let's go into the cell membrane. Basically the cellular membrane is a phospholipid bilayer membrane. I mean it has two layers and it is composed of phospholipids. It has a phosphate head and two lipid tails. The heads are hydrophilic, that means they love water, and the tails are hydrophobic, they're afraid of water. And that provides us with the cell to, to remain in an aqueous environment. And so it, the, the lipid bilayer, it, it contains phosphates, a cholesterol within the cell, and that provides it with stability. It also has embedded proteins. There are several proteins in the cell. They are large structures, and the proteins act as structural support, transporters, receptors, enzymes, and channels for nutrients to come through. It also, the lipid bilayer uh, also contains carbohydrates on the exterior of it, and these carbohydrates, they're either combined with, with proteins or fats, and if it's a protein, it's a glycoprotein or a glycolipid, as fats. Um, they, these act as as they send messages within the cell. So if you have something on the external environment, like uh, an invader, it will let the cell know that there's something approaching. It, it acts as identification markers and, again, the detection and defensive actions against invaders. The cytoplasm, that is the aqueous solution within the cellular membrane. It's the aqueous solution which all the organelles are in, and we don't consider the nucleus as an organelle. It provides a medium for energy production called anaerobic metabolism. Anaerobic means without oxygen. And anaerobic metabolism, it's in the cytoplasm, and it's a process known as glycolysis. I'll show you a pictorial representation closer to the end of the cell process um, where uh, I'll show you that. Okay, so the mitochondria, it's commonly referred to as the powerhouse of the cell because 
in that process, there is a, two cycles. There's the citric acid cycle, and then there's the electron transport system where you actually receive the adenosine triphosphates, the energy. That's why it's considered the powerhouse of the cell. All cells contain mitochondria except red blood cells, and some cells contain many mitochondria. They convert the foods to energy, um, to the energy yielding nutrients, carbohydrates, lipids, and the proteins. Like I said, energy production in the mitochondria is aerobic metabolism. That means it needs oxygen. And the process is called the citric acid cycle and the electron transport system where we receive the energy. Um, so let's keep moving forward, and I'll make that a little more clear. This is a, a big picture. Excuse me. This is a, a big pictorial representation of basically several different things. This is the cell and the nucleus. In the nucleus, we house chromosomes. Together, two chromatids will make a chromosome. And in the human bodies, there are 23 chromosomes in the nucleus. Now, if you were to take this chromosome and start to unravel it and unravel it and unravel it, you would end up coming down to sections of DNA. And th that is coiled around a histone. When the DNA is coiled around the histone, it's called a nucleosome. But if you were to continue uncoiling it past the histones and a little further, you will see segments of the DNA, a specific segment of the DNA. It is a gene. And here I'm showing that there are two genes. Now, if you were to uncoil it a little further and look deeper, you will see nucleotide base pairs here. And that is the DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. And what that DNA does, it codes for proteins. It makes proteins. OK, basically, the way our body makes proteins is by two processes. Um, one is transcription, and the next one is translation. In transcription, basically, it's copying the DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, in the nucleus into an RNA strand, a ribonucleic acid, more specifically, a messenger RNA. How this will happen is the RNA polymerase will bind to a promoter site on this double-stranded DNA helix and start to separate it. It will unzip it, so to speak. And as it does this, we will have nucleotide bases that will come, bind, come and bind to their complementary nucleotide base. For example, adenine will bind with thymine, guanine will bind with cytosine, and in the case of an RNA, uracil will bind with adenine. So as they start binding to these complementary nucleotide bases, it will build a strand of messenger RNA. Then next, in translation, that RNA will be exported out of the nucleus through its pores and go into the endoplasmic reticulum. And I'll refer to that as the ER. And in the ER, translation begins with the binding of that messenger RNA to a small subunit of ribosome. And this is a small subunit of ribosome. This is the messenger RNA. The binding of that messenger RNA to a ribosome initiates. There are three processes in translation, initiation, elongation, and termination. The binding of that messenger RNA to this ribosome will initiate a transfer RNA. Here is a transfer RNA to come down to its initiation point. Now, transfer RNA has three uh, nucleotide bases, and that is called a codon. Along with that, it will have a, an amino acid attached to it. So when it comes down and it binds to the messenger RNA, that will signal a large ribosome to come and attach to that group. And it has two binding sites of ribosomal proteins. And then another transfer RNA will come down and bind right after that. And as these transfer RNAs start coming down and binding to this messenger RNA and the ribosomal subunits, uh, the amino acids with energy will start to elongate. They will start attaching to a cell, and that is a process of elongation. Once the ribosomal subunits reach their termination point, it'll start and come down to a termination point. Once they reach that termination point, they, the transfer RNAs will go off and come back in a later time. And then the amino acids will uh, come to a termination part. 
they, they will be released and the protein will be formed. Okay, like I said, the Golgi complex, first you have the nucleus and the, the endoplasmic reticulum. So the, the, the messenger RNA will come out of the pores, it goes into the ER, it's, it's, the proteins are uh, processed in the endoplasmic reticulum and then they're sent out into the Golgi complex. The Golgi complex will receive the proteins from the ER, and what it is, it's kind of like a packaging plant. It, it sorts them out, modifies them, packages up the proteins for secretion out of the cell for use for the body. Okay, lysosomes and peroxisomes. Lysosomes are sacs that contain enzymes for the digestion of foreign material and worn out or damaged cellular components. They're referred to as suicide bags as the, the enzymes in there are destructive. Um, the cells associated with the immune system contain many lysosomes. Peroxisomes, the, this is a, a picture of a lysosome here. It's just a sac filled with fluid of enzymes. And a peroxisome contain enzymes that detoxify harmful chemicals. The detoxification of these chemicals will result in H2O2, hydrogen peroxide. And that is an oxidant, and it could cause damage to the, the lipid bilayer of the cellular membrane. So uh, the peroxisomes also contain a catalyst that decreases the hydrogen peroxide. And also the peroxisomes, they have a minor role in metabolizing alcohol. Okay, metabolism. It is the process in which all chemical reactions in the body undergo to support life. The building of compounds is called anabolism, kind of like anabolics, it, it builds. And the breakdown of compounds is called catabolism. It's kind of like catastrophe, but you know, it's not in a way because we need the breaking down of these, these pro, uh, substances. Okay, they allow us to release the energy from food and use it as carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Energy production begins in the cytoplasm, like I was pointing out, the anaerobic processing glycolysis. And it, it is the breakdown of glucose, and this is the molecular formula of glucose C6 h 12 6 and that will break the uh, glycolysis, starts off with glucose and ends up with pyruvate. Pyruvate will then enter the mitochondria, producing electrons used in the electron transport system to make adenosine triphosphate. Okay, this is the big picture representation I wanted to show you of the three systems. There's no need to memorize any of this. Excuse me. But what I do want you to, to catch here is that the three system is glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and the electron transport system. Glycolysis is in the cytosol. It is anaerobic, and it starts with glucose at six carbons and ends up with two three-carbon molecules of pyruvate. Okay, that's glycolysis in the cytosol. Now, in the mitochondria, pyruvate will cross the the inner membrane space of the mitochondria and it will go into the mitochondria where it will form acetyl-CoA, but I'm not worried about that now. Basically, it will go into a cyclic structure of a process of rejuvenating itself on a bunch of intermediates, and that will create, it will create uh, electrons in, in the form of hydrogens that will be passed down into the intermembrane space, the electron transport system, where those, those hydrogens are coming off of NADH and FADH, which is niacin and, and riboflavin. Um, those hydrogens will come off, and they will be coupled together into the electron transport system as adenosine triphate, triphosphates. Excuse me. Okay, so the systems. Um, again, uh, I'm not going to go over all of these systems in depth. I'm only going over them as they are related specifically to nutrition. Um, I'm going to cover the first eight in a general uh, manner, and then I'm going to go into depth with the digestive system for this level of a class. And then I will uh, not really go into the other three. I just wanted to point out that we have 12 systems in our body. So starting with the cardiovascular and the respiratory system, the, it is composed of plasma, red and white blood cells, that is the blood, and platelets and other substances in the blood. The blood will circulate from the right side of the heart through the lungs, releasing carbon dioxide and absorbing oxygen going back to the heart. So it releases from the right side of the heart 
and it will go into the lungs, releasing the carbon dioxide. It will then pick up the oxygen and go back to the left side of the heart. Then the oxygenated blood circulates from the left side of the heart through the body and back to the heart. So it circulates from the left side and it will go down to the trunks, to the legs. It will also go to the upper extremities, the head and the arms uh, as it is said to be oxygenated. Blood leaving the left side of the heart travels in arteries uh, to small capillaries and these are the capillaries. What happens the arteries uh, go away from the heart and the veins bring the blood back into the heart. And the capillaries is where it meets in the, in the tissues that are releasing and you're receiving uh, the nutrients or exchanging gases or substances like that. So the blood leaving the left side of the heart will travel in, into small capillaries delivering the nutrients, blood cells, oxygen, and hormones throughout the body's tissues. Blood picked up from capillaries travels through the veins back to the heart carrying the oxygen. Most nutrients picked up from the intestinal capillaries drain into the portal vein, and I got a picture of that a little later, and they go directly to the liver for processing. So in the intestinal system, you will pick up a lot of the nutrients that, from water or soluble nutrients going into uh, veins that will drain into the portal vein and go to the liver for processing. Okay, the urinary system. Basically, it is composed of a kidney, a ureter, the bladder, and it's excreted through the urethra. On top of the kidneys, you have adrenal glands, and, and those produce hormones, uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine, that are released whenever you have the, the fight or flight uh, sympathetic, parasympathetic systems. You, you need the energy, so what happens is, is whenever it releases these hormones, um, it, it increases blood glucose, but I'll, I'll point that out in a couple minutes. So basically, um, what I want you to take home with this urinary system, the, the kidneys do many functions. And the main thing right here that I want you to understand, and I got a little bit of stuff right here, don't have to memorize this. I, I find that when you go a little bit further into something, it helps you remember the simpler thing a little more. So basically, the kidneys will convert vitamin D3 in, from its inactive form to its active form. Now, a little more in depth, just for your information. Uh, it, how it does this is through the sun and through our diet, we'll take in vitamin D3. And it will be converted uh, in the liver. It, you will, we will add a hydroxyl onto the 25th carbon, and it will be called 25-hydroxy vitamin D3. Then it will go through the kidneys and add another hydroxyl on there, and it will be called 1,25-dihydroxy vitamin D3. But basically, again, I just want you to know that the kidneys will convert the inactive form of vitamin D to the active form. Now, also, it works with the cardiovascular system to maintain blood pressure, pH, and fluid balance. It regulates potassium, calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium. It eliminates toxic substances such as urea and creatinine. It also secretes erythropoietin. Um, it, that is a hormone responsible for stimulating red blood cell production. And again, here is something a little more complex. I just, here I want you to, to recognize that, that the kidneys will assist in the process of glucose production. And further down the line in an undergraduate level, you will learn the uh, urea cycle and the process of transamination. Um, now I'll go through a little bit of transamination in protein, so um, in this level. But basically, here again, I just want you to recognize the kidneys will uh, also assist in glucose production. So the lymphatic system. Here, as you, you notice, this picture of uh, the lymph system in our bodies. It goes through all out the bodies, and this is an aqueous fluid. Uh, the lymphatic system is a network of vessels that circulate lymph fluid that consists mostly of Sorry, I, I thought I didn't have my uh, microphone on. <laughs> okay, so it, it consists of mostly blood plasma with white blood cells important for the immune system. The lymph is picked up by the lymph vessels in the interstitial spaces. In between the cells is considered the interstitial spaces and collects in the thoracic duct behind the heart and then it will drain into the left subclavian vein and deposit it into the heart. 
Lymph in the GI tract will, it picks up most of the large fats and fat soluble vitamins. So here you have a, a picture of the lymph going in between the veins and the arteries, um, picking up mostly fat soluble vitamins and large fat uh, products. The nervous system. I have here a, a picture of a neuron. This is a single cell in the nervous system as a neuron. Uh, it has what I, I consider a head, that is the dendrite, and uh, the tail end of it is an axon. Now what happens is we get a stimulus from an outside environment uh, with inside the body or outside, and most of those stimuli come from receptors in the ears, uh, eyes, nose, skin, and the stomach. And what happens is we have at a resting state, this neuron is said to be uh, polarized. It is polarized because the sodium is on the outside of the cell and the potassium is on the inside of the cell. Now, if you're thinking a little ahead of me, you notice that the sodium has a positive charge and the potassium has also a positive charge, so how can it be polarized? Well, the nucleic acids within the cell give a, an overall total negative charge as compared to the sodium on the outside of the cell. So what happens is, it, it, right now it is in its resting state and it's polarized. But when we have a stimulus, it will become depolarized. And that depolarization causes the sodium to influx through these protein channels and the potassium to come outside of the channels. And that causes a depolarization. And then that will travel, that that signal will travel all the way down the, the axon to the terminal ends of the axon. Now what you see here, these are myelin sheaths, and since this is nutrition lecture, it, myelin sheaths need the vitamin B12 for their formation. So what happens is, it, again, the depolarization will go down, sending the signal down to the synaptic space. Once it gets to the synaptic space, then it has to get over to the next neuron. And how that does, how that works is through neurotransmitters. Um, there are several neurotransmitters, uh, for the most part acetylcholine, and here I've, I've showed that some amino acids are converted to neurotransmitters. Uh, tryptophan is converted to serotonin and tyrosine to norepinephrine and epinephrine, which I spoke about earlier. So once this, this depolarization goes down all the way down to the synaptic space, it will release calcium in this channel. And the calcium will release the neurotransmitters, where those neurotransmitters will jump across the synaptic space, bind to the channels on the other cell, causing the depolarization there. OK, so the endocrine system. Hormones are the chemical messengers of the endocrine system that respond to internal and external changes of the body. They have permissive, antagonistic, and synergistic roles in the regulation of metabolism, reproduction, water balance, and other regulatory processes. Uh, permissive means to turn on, antagonistic means to turn off, and synergistic means to work with. Um, insulin and glucagon are produced in the pancreas. Here we have a, a picture of the pancreas, and basically what I want to, to look at here is this round structure. It looks like little purple dots here. That is the endocrine gland, and that is called the islets of Langerhans. In, in, within, this, within those, this is a, an expanded view of this islet of Langerhans. And the little purples, purple patches, are the alpha cells, and they release glucagon. And the surrounding cells all around that are the beta cells that release insulin. Glucagon. Uh, here, let me read this. Epinephrine, norepinephrine, glucagon, and growth hormone increase blood glucose levels. So again, like if, you're, you, if you have to have energy, you know, that there's danger coming to you or you're excited, you'll get energy. And, and these substances will increase blood glucose levels so you'll have the energy. Um, and insulin does the opposite. It, it decreases blood glucose levels. The job of insulin is to get the, the glucose out of the, the system and into the cell. Okay, the immune system. I'm going to go over three parts here, the skin, intestinal cells, and white blood cells. Um, they protect us from pathogens. The nutrients, protein, minerals, iron, copper, zinc, folate, vitamins A, B6, 
B12, and vitamin C are important for the synthesis, growth, development, and activities of the immune cells and other components involved from protecting us from invading pathogens. The skin is our first line of defense. Essential fatty acids, vitamin A again, niacin and zinc are important for the skin's protection. Here's an example. Vitamin A deficiency will decrease lysosome activity secretions on the skin, thereby decreasing the risk of infection. The intestine cells prevent pathogens from entering our body with specialized immune cells. And I'll show you those in a second. Um, such as immunoglobulins that are part of the mucosal membrane. Uh, protein, vitamin A, B6, B12, vitamin C, folate, and zinc are of special interest to promote intestinal health and prevent diarrhea and infection. So the white blood cells. Here's a small little graph that I, I've made, uh, very basic of our immune system. Um, we, we, when we're born, we have an innate immune system. We're born with it. Then we, as we progress, uh, we become adaptive to these invaders, the pathogens. And that comes through either humoral, which basically means fluids, or cell-mediated. So the pathogens that make it into the bloodstream will be attacked by white blood cells. Phagocytes will ingest or digest these invaders through phagocytosis with their lysosome enzymes. The white blood cells, they participate in cell-mediated immunity. And when certain cells are directly attacked an invader, by an invader, or when an invader presents an antigen or protein that elicits a specific antibody in response to the, uh, the antigen. So an invader will have an antigen on the outside, and our immunity will re recognize that antigen of what type of invader it is, and it will attack it. If, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. If we, if we don't recognize that invader, and uh, we have to build up immunity for it, so our cells have memory, and then the next time they see it, they'll bring the, in the backup for that cell, or for that, that uh, pathogen. Uh, nutrients that are necessary for the immune, immune response are iron, and it's used as a killing factor. Copper for white blood cell synthesis. Protein, B6, B12, vitamin C, and folate is for synthesis and cell activity. Zinc and vitamin A for growth and development of the immune cells. Okay, the digestive system. This is a little lengthy, but uh, enjoy it. The digestion, it, it is consists of the mouth, the pharynx, the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine, the large intestine, the rectum, and the anus. So I'm going to go into each one of these a little bit in detail. And starting with the digestion, it is a process of breaking down foods into nutrients to, to prepare for absorption. Absorption is the uptake of nutrients by the cells of the gastrointestinal tract for transport into either the blood or the limb. The gastrointestinal tract is a flexible, flexible muscular lumen, which is the same as a tube, that extends from the mouth to the anus. Uh, nutrients and other substances are absorbed only when they cross the gastrointestinal tract wall. So basically, if you swallow something, if it's not absorbed into the body, it is considered not in the body. Uh, many materials may pass through the gastrointestinal tract without being digested or absorbed. Okay, excuse me. Okay, digestion, there's, there's a, several ways of breaking substances down. Um, it, dealing with catalysts, they are, catalysts are compounds that facilitate chemical reactions without itself being changed in the process. There are many catalysts in our body. Um, minerals are, are a catalyst, and they are definitely involved in glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and the electron transport system. They facilitate the molecules to, they promote them from one to another. Um, hydrolysis is a chemical reaction in which water is added to a large molecule and, and, and 
and it breaks it into smaller molecules. Uh, uh, water is a universal solvent, and it also works that, acts that way in our body. Um, digestive enzymes are proteins found in digestive juices that break food into substances into smaller compounds. So this is, the gastrointestinal tract also, we have to consider the accessory digestive organs, and that are the saliv salivary glands, the liver, gallbladder, and the pancreas. They release secretions into the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract. Okay, starting with the mouth. The mouth, the process of digestion starts in the mouth. The mouth, or oral cavity, contains the teeth and tongue. Um, the incisors of the teeth, they will cut. The canine will tear. The premolar and the molars will grind. Mastication is the process of chewing. We call it mastication. The saliva moistens the food. And saliva also contains mucus, so it lubricates the food with mucus. And it, it, the saliva gives us the ability to have taste perception of the food. And it will also release starch digesting enzymes, and it will initiate this swallowing reflex. So the mouth, the teeth break down large particles into smaller particles, and that is mechanical digestion that can be further broken down by enzymes, which is chemical digestion. The tongue helps to move the, and mix the particles with the saliva to help in the process of chewing, swallowing, and tasting as saliva dissolves the particles. Saliva is produced in the salivary glands. It contains water, salts, mucus, and enzymes such as amylase, which works on carbohydrate starch. Um, it starts the chemical digestion of the carbohydrates. It protects the teeth and the lining of the gastrointestinal tract and helps to prevent bacterial growth. It provides a medium for taste perception. Um, the, the saliva is liquid chemicals, basically, and your taste buds will not taste the food itself unless you have the saliva to transmit the messages of the taste. It provides the medium for that taste perception. The four basic tastes are sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and some scientists consider the, the flavor of monosodium glutamate as savory, and the, its Asian name is umami. So then you could say the five tastes are sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. Okay, the pharynx, it is part of the digestive system. Let me show you where the pharynx basically is. It's in back, posterior, of the nasal cavity. It is back of the oral cavity, and it is superior to the larynx. So it is about five inches long, and the, um, the larynx is part of the respiratory system, and the esophagus is part of the digestive system. So uh, the, the, um, the pharynx sits on top of the esophagus, and what happens is the epiglottis, that is a cartilage. This epiglottis is a cartilage. And to prevent you from aspirating, having food go into your, into your larynx, into the trachea, and into the lungs, lungs the epiglottis will close on, over the glottis. The, the trachea will actually come up, and the, glottis will, the epiglottis will cover over the glottis, allowing the food passage all the way down into the esophagus. Okay, the esophagus, it is a long muscular lumen for passing uh, food in, in the form of a bolus. It's a long muscular lumen for passing food from the pharynx to the stomach. The esophagus has two sphincters. They are circular muscles, one at the top and one before the stomach. This is the esophageal sphincter, and the one at the bottom is the lower esophageal sphincter. This, the, um, and they help regulate the passage of the bolus. A bolus is the amount of food swallowed at one time. The esophageal sphincter opens in response to swallowing. And the lower esophageal sphincter is sometimes referred to as the cardiac sphincter, and that helps prevent the food from backing back into the esophagus, causing gastroesophageal reflux and what we know as heartburn. Okay, peristalsis. This is waves of muscular contractions that push the food forward along the GI tract, meaning forward from the esophagus all the way to the anus. The, the GI tract is lined with two sets of muscles, 
through the whole GI tract, except for the stomach, which has three. But there are circular and longitudinal muscles. As the circular muscles contract, the longitudinal muscles relax. And likewise, as the longitudinal muscles contract, the circular muscles will relax. And that is a process of uh, pushing the food forward. It occurs continuously at different rates depending on the part of the GI tract it is in and, and the presence of food. For example, uh, it will go, uh, peristalsis will um, go three times per minute in the stomach and ten times per minute through the small intestine. And again, peristalsis and the sphincters keep the mo uh, food moving in the right direction. Okay, the stomach, I'm going to first go over the structure and a little bit of the, the enzymes. The stomach is a muscular expandable reservoir that holds about four cups or one liter of foods. It begins after the lower esophageal sphincter and ends at the pyloric sphincter. It has three layers of muscles, the longitudinal layer, the circular layer, and the oblique layer. And they help churn, mix, and grind the bolus into a liquid mass called chyme. It has three regions. It has the fundus, the body, and the pylorus region. The rough folds inside the stomach are called rugae, and that allows for the stomach to expand whenever it gets full and whenever it, it contracts again after it's emptied, then you'll see these rough folds called rugae. The rough, uh, um, okay, the stomach adds ac acids and enzymes to help the digestive process. And we're going to go over some of those now. The stomach contains gastric glands that secrete gastric juice, which contains water, enzymes, and hydrochloric acid. The gastric juice starts protein digestion, and that begins in the stomach. Remember, um, the beginning of carbohydrate digestion is in the mouth. The beginning of protein digestion is in the stomach. And this is a, a what they call a tertiary structure. Proteins are all bound up into a globular uh, structure, and the hydrochloric acid will denature that and unfold them. Uh, the hydrochloric acid also kills most bacteria that enter the body uh, with the food. The acid causes heartburn when it refluxes into the esophagus, and the acidity of the gastric juice is necessary for the protein digestion enzymes to work efficiently. Also, the salivary amylase will not work in this acidic environment. Okay, the st stomach secretions. There are several different cells. I'm going to go over four cells here with you. And basically, first, I want to point out, this is a, a cross-sectional view of the lining of the stomach. And this is the, the surface, the mucosal uh, membrane of the stomach. And here we have the, the beginning of it is the gastric pit. And down further is the gastric gland. The gastric gland has many different types of cells. And the gastric pit, pit uh, contains mostly uh, cells that secrete mucus. Okay, so beginning with the, the parieta cells, that's these structures right here, the parieta cells of the gastric glands secrete hydrochloric acid. And like I said, that denatures the protein, it unfolds the proteins. The parieta cells also secrete intrinsic factor, which is needed for B12 absorption in the small intestine, and most specifically in the ileum. Okay, goblet cells. These are goblet cells right here. And again, they are close to the surface of the stomach on the inside. And they produce a mucin. And when that mucin mixes with water, it produces mucus. And that protects the stomach lining from hydrochloric acid and protein digestive enzymes. The chief cells down here in the gastric gland, they secrete pepsinogen. Pepsinogen it's activated by the hydrochloric acid to pepsin. And that breaks down proteins into peptide fragments, starts chopping the, the pieces of protein up and all the way down to amino acids. The G cells down here on the bottom of the, the gastric gland, those are also called enteroendocrine endocrine cells. And I'll refer to that in the, the lumen of the small intestine. But these enteroendocrine cells, they secrete gastrin. And gastrin, it's a hormone that activates these parietal cells. And those parietal cells, again, they secrete the hydrochloric acid 
and the intrinsic factor needed for B12 absorption. Okay, so in general, the stomach acid, it destroys the activity of proteins. It activates digestive enzymes. It partially digests dietary protein. It assists in calcium absorption, and it makes dietary minerals soluble for absorption. Okay, passing the food through the stomach. The stomach will hold the food that was consumed between one and four hours. It will be held in the fundus, and as the stomach muscles break down the bolus further, it will pass through the body, and little by little, it will be transferred to the pylorus region, where it will be saturated by the gastric juices and turned into the semi-liquid kind. The pyloric sphincter, it, it's a circular muscle at the end of the stomach that controls the passage of the chyme into the small intestine, and the beginning part of the small intestine is called the duodenum, the, or duodenum. People refer to it as either name, and it's even actually in the dictionary as both. So I will refer to it as the duodenum. And it releases the chyme into the, the, the pyloric sphincter releases the chyme into the duodenum at approximately five milliliters at a time. So absorption in the stomach basically is very limited. Uh, it, it, it will absorb about approximately 20% alcohol and a little bit of water. So the small intestine. The small intestine is approximately 20 feet long and it's about one inch in diameter and it is formed by the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. Here I have a colored picture where you'll see the duodenum and the jejunum and the ileum. The duodenum is approximately one foot long, which begins at the du duodenal bulb. This is the duodenal bulb where it attaches um, right after the, uh, the lower esophageal sphincter. Or the, I'm sorry, the pyloric sphincter. And it is actually hung by what is called the ligament of trites. It is a, a couple muscles that hang the, the duodenum onto the diaphragm, and, and it provides it for uh, an uplift. So again, the, uh, the jejunum is approximately 8 feet long, and the ileum is around 11 feet. And they are both, both supported. The jejunum and the ileum are, again, supported, and they're supported by mesentery you know, behind them, starting at the duodenal flexure, and this is the duodenal flexure, um, and ends at the ileocecal valve, which is where the small intestine connects to the large intestine. And the uh, ileocecal valve, that prevents the uh, contents from the colon backing back up into the small intestine. Okay, the small intestine. It, it, first, you'll notice that the lumen contains a rough looking circles on the inside. And these are called the plaque circularis. They are circular folds and they are ridges that force the food to spiral forward. The spiral motion and segmentation, segmentation is when the circular muscles start squeezing the food and the longitudinal muscles start pushing it forward. Uh, it helps mix the chyme with the digestive juices. The villi, the villi, now this is an expanded view of the surface of the inside of the lumen of the small intestine. And for the most part, they're, they're pretty much similar in the uh, duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum, except for the jejunum's uh, epithelium is longer because that's pretty much where we do the absorption. In the duodenum, it's pretty much where we do a lot of uh, secreting the digestive enzymes. So the, the villi and the microvilli, you'll see here that you'll have the arterioles, they come into the the epithelial cells, and this is considered the brush border. You have the, the long uh, villi structures, and then you have, on top of that, you have microvilli, which will have hair-like structures that trap the food in there and help it uh, digest it and absorb it. Um, so again, we have the arteriole, and we have the venules, and in between those is the lacteal from the lymphatic system, which collects the aqueous fluid um, and some fat particles. And again, we have the circular muscle and the longitudinal muscles. So the villi and the microvilli, they increase the surface area of the intestine for more contact with the chyme to promote increased digestion and absorption. The small intestine is the major site of digestion of food and absorption of nutrients. 
It contains enzymes that digest all the carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids. The structure of the small intestine is similar to the rest of the gastrointestinal tract in that, it, that its mucosa is a simple columnar epithelium. It has submucosa, smooth muscle with inner circular and outer longitudinal layers, and the serosa. The epithelial of the jejunum is somewhat longer, like I was saying, than that of the duodenum and the ileum due to it being the primary site for most of our energy yielding nutrients. The cell walls absorb the nutrients into the blood or the limb. Okay, the duo, let's start with the duodenum. The first few inches of the duodenal lining is basically smooth, but the rest of its lining has the circular folds, the circular picolari, the circular folds, and the villi. The pancreas will secrete pancreatic juice, which contain enzymes that are carbohydrates, proteases, and lipases that continue the digestion of the carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids, respectively. The pancreas also releases a biocarbonate, which is an alkaline, and it neutralizes the acidic chyme coming from the stomach. So the, the, the chyme coming from the stomach, stomach is really acidic anywhere between 1.5 to 3 pH, dependent upon the type of food and the amount of food you have in, your, your, uh, in the chyme. So the bile produced by the liver and concentrated and stored in the gallbladder flows into the common bile duct. Now, the digestive enzymes will come through the pancreatic duct, and the, the bile will come through the common bile duct and they will both meet at the sphincter of Audi and be released into the duodenum. Okay, fat digestion. Bile is an emulsifier, and that suspends fats into water to allow enzymes to break them down. An emulsifier is a substance composed of water and fat-soluble parts uh, that promotes mixing of oils and fats in a watery solution. Okay, let's go into the duodenum again, uh, into the um, enzymes in the duodenum. Okay, Brunner's glands are specific to the duodenum. You don't see those in the uh, jejunum or the ileum, uh, which produces a mucus-rich alkaline secretion. So you have several cells in the duodenum releasing a mucus-rich secretion to, to start neutralizing the pH of the chyme. Um, here we have, uh, for example, goblet cells will release that secretion. The epithelial will release mucus secretions. Um, secretin is, is a hormone secreted by the S cells, and they're down here, uh, S cells in the crypts. And this is, again, it's similar to the crypts I was showing you in the uh, stomach. These are the interior folds in the stomach. And these are the crypts of Libricon, of the duodenum, which causes secretions of biocarbonate-rich pancreatic juice. Again, we have more biocarbonate to neutralize, the uh, to make it an alkaline uh, kind. The alkaline and biocarbonate secretions into the, S, into the small intestine neutralize the acid from the stomach to a pH of around 5 to 6. Now, cholecystokinin, that is a hormone released by the enteroendocrine cells. And, in, in, as I was pointing out, the enteroendocrine cells at the bottom of the, the glands, the gastric pit, are where you have the uh, enteroendocrine cells. They are hormone cells. And they release the cholecystokinin into the duodenum, which stimulates the re release of digestive enzymes of the pancreas and bile from the gallbladder for the digestion of proteins and fats and decreases stomach motility. Now, cholecystokinin, it releases the bile and um, the pancreatic enzymes, the digestive enzymes to, to break down the fats and the proteins, and it also will slow down the, the motility of the stomach. Now, for a long time, this gastric inhibitory peptide was thought to do that same thing, was to slow down motility of the stomach. But we call that GIP, and, and it is known as gastric inhibitory peptide. But later, it is known as, referred to as the glucose-dependent insulinotropic peptide, meaning it signals for the release of insulin into the duodenum. And 
That way you pull the glucose from the, uh, from the chyme into uh, the cells further down the line. So the jejunum and ileum, I, I paired these together because there, there is no specific point in which the, the jejunum stops and the ileum starts. But there are distinguishable, distinguishable features of each. Excuse me. The jejunum, like I was saying, it has larger villi, and the circular folds are larger um, there than the duodenum and the ileum. The jejunum's main purpose is to absorb nutrients from the contents coming from that duodenum. The jejunum also has an increased amount of goblet cells that secrete the mucus, so it protects the lining there also. The ileum's primary function is to absorb vitamin B12 bile salts, and products of digestion that were not absorbed by the jejunum. So the jejunum does most of the absorption. The ileum also has the dominance of lymphoid tissue um, called Peyer's patches, which provides for leukocytes to fight against invaders. Um, and it is, you know, uh, round there toward the colon, so it, 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 the colon houses a lot of bacteria. So the last part of the small intestine will house these pyre patches to, provide against, uh, to fight against these invaders. So absorption. Capillaries are the small vessels, which I pointed out earlier, that branch from arterioles. Um, gas, nutrients, and waste exchange takes place across these capillary walls. Lacteals are lymphatic capillaries in the villi of the small intestine that collect and transport uh, lipids and fat-soluble vitamins absorbed by the digestive tract. Chylomicrons are lipoproteins. Lipoproteins are a protein surrounding a, a bunch of lipids and, and that transport absorbed fatty acids that are too large to diffuse into the blood capillaries so they are transported in the lymphatic system. Absorption in the small intestine. After about three or four hours of eating a meal, the molecules derived from proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates are absorbed along with vitamins and minerals. This is where we have most absorption in uh, the small intestine. Uh, nutrients are absorbed into either the blood or the lymph by different transport mechanisms, and I'm going to go over those. Simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and active transport. So starting with passive diffusion, or simple diffusion, and it's also known as osmosis. It is when a, the concentration of a nutrient inside the small intestine is greater than inside its absorptive cell. So the nutrients will pass into the absorptive cell to create an equilibrium. And an example of some of these nutrients is fats, water, and some minerals. Facilitated diffusion means just that. It's facilitated by a protein carrier. Um, it requires this protein carrier to move across the absorptive cell. And an example of this facilitated diffusion would be fructose. OK, active absorption. That requires energy in the form of ATP. What happens here is a carrier protein is needed to move across, uh, to move the nutrients across an absorptive cell's membrane, even when there is not a difference in the concentration gradient outside and inside the cell. So what, what happens is the ATP will attach to this, this protein carrier, causing it to open. The nutrients will come in, and then it will release us on the inside whether it has a, a, a more outside and inside the cell or not. Okay, phagocytosis and pinocytosis are very similar. Um, they basically, it's the formation of invaginations invag on the membrane. It will engulf a, a particle, a, a, a compound in, in, the, in the case of phagocytosis. It will be a solid. In the, in the case of pinocytosis, it would be a liquid. And it engulfs it, it surrounds it, and brings it into the cell, respectively, and breaks it off to form vacuoles in the cytoplasm. Okay, so nutrients absorbed in the small intestine. And I've kind of broken these down into the different sections of the small intestine. So starting in the duodenum, you have minerals such as calcium, magnesium, and iron are absorbed in the duodenum. In the jejunum, this is where we... Uh, absorb most of our energy yielding nutrients, glucose, amino acids, fats, 
and vitamins. And again, in the ileum, this is where we absorb bile salts, vitamin B12. Now, uh, like I said earlier, the stomach will absorb a little bit of alcohol, but for the most part, it absorbed in the small intestine around 80%. And water, um, it absorbed mostly in the ileum. Actually, most of the water is actually absorbed in the jejunum. But since the epithelia are long and have very loose gaps in between the cells, it allows the water to come back in. So it creates a, an isotonic uh, solution. But the ileum, it functions more efficiently where it has very tight gaps. So when it, and it absorbs the water, it doesn't have the ability to influx back in. So the ileum absorbs most of the water, approximately 70%. Okay, here's a picture I was telling you about, about the portal circulation. The nutrients that come from the small intestine and the large intestine will drain into two veins, one from the superior mesenteric and the inferior mesenteric for the large intestine. And they drain, these veins drain into the hepatic portal vein and they go directly to the liver for processing. Okay, the large intestine, now, also known as the colon, is a muscular tube with a larger diameter uh, than the small intestine and it forms the lower portion of the intestines. There are no villi or digestive enzymes released in the large intestine. It reabsorbs water and minerals and passes waste fiber, bacteria, and unabsorbed nutrients, and water to the rectum. It is formed by the ascending colon, the transverse colon, the descending colon, and the sigmoid colon, and here we have the rectum and the anus. Uh, the large intestine, it completes the digestive process. The ileocecal valve, again, here, um, it's a muscular, circular muscular valve that separates the small intestine from the large intestine and that regulates the passage of undigested materials into the colon. So the nutrients absorbed in the large intestine are minimal sodium, potassium, some fatty acids, and a little bit of water. Okay, the appendix, rectum, and the anus. The appendix is a, it's a thin tube about four inches long and it's attached to the large intestine. Um, it is close to the junction of the small intestine here, and it stores lymphatic cells that defend the body against pathogens. The rectum is a small muscular duct that forms the terminal part of the intestines. Again, this is the rectum. And it stores waste feces prior to the elimination, which is defecation. The anus is the end part of the, the gastrointestinal tract. It keeps uh, the, the, the rectum closed. It contains two muscular sphincters that control defecation. It, allows, it opens to allow for the elimination. The interior one is involuntary, and the exterior uh, anal sphincter is a voluntary muscle that you can control. Okay, colon health. The stomach and the small intestine have some bacteria present, but the large intestine has a lot of bacterial species, approximately 500. The intestinal bacteria plays a significant role in colon health. The small intestine and the large intestine are neutral in pH, which allows the growth of intestinal bacteria that is not harmful. These bacteria produce vitamin K, biotin and other substances, and they break down some undigested compounds. They help to maintain harmful bacteria under control. The undigested materials, such as fiber, they continue to move through the gastrointestinal tract as a semi-solid semi mass that helps exercise the gastro gastrointestinal tract muscles, and that keeps the peristalsis working efficiently. So you need the fiber to exercise the muscles of the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, fiber retains water, which helps make the stools pasty. And stool is, they are waste matter discharged from the colon. Okay, now I'm going to wrap this up with problems associated with the digestive system. There's, there's eight the challenges that we encounter with the digestive system that I'm going to go over. Um, and starting with ulcers. They occur in the esophagus, stomach, and the small intestine. 
Um, the cause is H. pylori. It's, it's Helicobacter pylori. It's known as H. pylori bacteria. And that is a bacteria infection of the mucosus li mucosal lining of the stomach that causes overproduction of the stomach acid. And that bacterial infection, it will start in the mucosal lining and then it will start going deeper into the submucosa and, and cause scarring. So that is one cause of ulcers. Another cause is NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as large doses of aspirin and there are other medications that are NSAIDs. Um, nicotine and stress will also cause ulcers. Uh, the treatment for ulcers is stop smoking if you smoke. Avoid large doses of NSAIDs. Decrease coffee, tea, and alcohol, especially wine if you drink this in large quantities. Um, if you like spicy foods, decrease peppers, chili powder, and the strong spices. spices. Uh, eat nutritious meals on schedule with fiber. Have a, a regular diet, small meals at intervals on schedule. Chew foods well, lose weight if you're overweight, and anti-acids will help um, as they, they are proton inhibitors. What they do is they, they will block uh, the production of hydrogen ions that, that, that cause an acidic level. A heartburn, the re recommendations here are heartburn basically, again, is the stomach, the, the uh, chyme will back up into the esophagus through the lower esophageal sphincter. And that happens for several reasons. Um, um, basically, the lower esophageal sphincter doesn't close all the way, or there are a couple other. And the recommendations are avoid eating at bedtime, three to four hours before bedtime. When you lay down, it might have the chance to, to seep into the esophagus. Eating small meals with liquids between the meals, elevate the head of your bed, avoid tobacco, and lose weight if you're overweight. You should limit these, these substances here because they have a tendency to relax the lower esophageal sphincter, and that is limit chocolate, caffeine, alcohol, garlic, high-fat foods, citrus, and peppermint. Okay, constipation. It is a difficult or infrequent evacuation. The causes are, are several. I ignoring normal bowel movements, muscle spasm, uh, calcium, iron supplements, and antacids. Um, they will decrease the water in, in your uh, fecal material. A lack of fiber, a lack of fluid, and a lack of physical activity that will uh, stimulate motility of the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, the treatment is dietary fiber will stimulate the peristalsis by drawing water into the intestine, and fluid helps soften the stools for movement. Regular physical activity will stimulate the motility of the uh, small intestine. And laxatives, they will help in a couple different ways. Um, one is they irritate the intestinal nerve junctions, and that stimulates the peristalsis, the movement. Another way is it will draw water into the intestine. And these, they should not be used a lot. Regular use should be supervised by a physician. Okay, hemorrhoids, also known as piles, excuse me, these are swollen veins of the rectum and the anus. They are an intense pressure, come from an intense pressure and straining, also from prolonged sitting, sitting or chronic coughing. The recommendation here is eat fiber and drink fluids. Also, again, you know, don't sit too long on the toilet and, and, and uh, don't strain too hard. Okay, irritable bowel syndrome. The symptoms are cramps, bloating, uh, and irregular bowel function, such as diarrhea and or constipation. The causes are altered intestinal peristalsis with a decreased pain threshold for abdominal distension. So once your abdominal starts to distend, getting bigger, distending, um, you have a low tolerance for that pain. So the individualized treatment is an elimination diet. And that means no dairy products. Some vegetables such as legumes, cabbage, and broccoli, and some fruits such as grapes, raisins, cherries, and cantaloupe. Um, moderate caffeine, have a low-fat diet, uh, eat small and frequent meals, and reduce your stress. Okay, diarrhea. It is a, an increase in fluidity, uh, frequency, or the amount of bowel movements. The causes are 
infections in the intestine with bacteria and viruses. Uh, poorly absorbed substances like sorbitol and or a, a very high fiber diet such as bran which will increase water absorption. Okay, the treatment, uh, drink plenty of fluid with diarrhea so you can uh, replenish your water in your body so you won't dehydrate. Treatment should be within 24 to 48 hours for infants and elderly people. And diarrhea greater than seven days should be investigated by a physician. Gallstones. Normally gallstones are composed of hardened crystal-like pieces of cholesterol in the bile. Mostly related to being overweight, genetics has a, a role in there, diabetes, and also your diet. Symptoms is the upper right abdominal pain, uh, gas, bloating, nausea, and vomiting. The treatment here is removal of the gallbladder. Celiac disease. It is an allergic reaction to gluten. Um, gluten will flatten the villi and it le uh, limits the absorption in the small intestine. And the treatment here is to eliminate uh, the gluten through elimination of wheat and rye, which contains gluten. A cystic fibrosis. It's also known as mucoviscidosis. And that means the mucus is, is very uh, thick and sticky. Um, CF is a condition from a defected gene. It's an autosomal disorder related to chromosomes, and which affects the cells that produce mucus, sweat, and the digestive juices. Instead of acting as a lubricant, the secretions become thick and sticky. Uh, the mucus blocks the pancreatic ducts. It impairs digestion of carbohydrates, protein, and the fats. The treatment for this is to have replacement enzymes for the nutrients to help break down and digest the, the energy yielding nutrients. Diverticular disease. The small pouches in the colon, these small pouches that you'll see right here in the colon, that bulge outward through weak spots are called diverticulum. More than one is called diverticula, and when the pouches become infected or inflamed, the condition is called diverticulitis. It is believed that a low fiber diet is the main cause. The symptoms are abdominal pain, fever, nausea, vomiting, cramps, and constipation. Um, the treatment for this is increased fiber in your diet. Thank you.